بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والنازعات غرقا والناشطات نشطا والسابحات سبحا السابقات سبقا المدبرات أمرا يوم ترجف الراجفة تتبعها الرادفة قلوب يومئذ واجفة أبصارها خاشعة يقولون أئنا لمردودون في الحافرة أإذا كنا عظاما نخرة قالوا تلك إذا كرة خاسرة فإنما هي زجرة واحدة فإذا هم بالساهرة هل أتاك حديث موسى إذ ناداه ربه بالواد المقدس طوى اذهب إلى فرعون إنه طغى فقل هل لك إلى أن تزكى وأهديك إلى ربك فتخشى فأراه الآية الكبرى فكذب وعصى ثم أدبر يسعى فحشر فنادى فقال أنا ربكم الأعلى فأخذه الله نكال الآخرة والأولى إن في ذلك لعبرة لمن يخشى أأنتم أشد خلقا أم السماء بناها رفع سمكها فسواها وأغطش ليلها وأخرج ضحاها والأرض بعد ذلك دحاها أخرج منها ماءها ومرعاها والجبال أرساها متاعا لكم ولأنعامكم فإذا جاءت الطامة الكبرى يوم يتذكر الإنسان ما سعى وبرزت الجحيم لمن يرى فأما من طغى وآثر الحياة الدنيا فإن الجحيم هي المأوى وأما من خاف مقام ربه ونهى النفس عن الهوى فإن الجنة هي المأوى يسألونك عن الساعة أيان مرساها فيما أنت من ذكراها إلى ربك منتهاها إنما أنت منذر من يخشاها كأنهم يوم يرونها لم يلبثوا إلا عشية أو ضحاها Abraha was the governor of Yemen under Najashi. So Najashi, not the same Najashi as the one that the Prophet ﷺ Sahaba emigrated to, but his father. That Najashi had conquered some areas of Yemen. And he had sent his governor, and his governor's name was Abraha. So Abraha was the governor of the Najashi in Yemen. 
And he saw his people every year go north. So he said, where are you guys going? So they said, we have to go to Hajj. He said, why? What is there? He said, there's the house of Allah. So he said, I will build you a house that is far better than any of your houses. And you will come for Hajj under here. So he built a massive cathedral because they were Christians. And it was out of glass and out of, can you imagine in Arabia to bring stained glass? because they had access to these architects and whatnot. And he built a cathedral in Yemen, the likes of which he thought would become the biggest temple of Christianity in the entire Arabian Peninsula. And he then said, all of you have to come over here rather than going to up north to the Kaaba. And when one of the Bedouins heard this, he went there, but he went there to relieve himself, number one and number two. And he went there and he did that. And he became so angry, Abraha, that he said, as revenge, I will destroy this house so people must come to my house. And that is why he gathered together his army. And of course, because they were from Abyssinia, so they had elephants. Otherwise, elephants did not live in the Arabian Peninsula as natural beasts over there. But because he was from Africa, so he had a group of African elephants. And of course, the people of Africa had trained the elephants to be instruments of war. And uh, this was when he marched to the Kaaba and he went with his army of around, they say some say eight and some say 20 elephants. And the chief elephant, by the way, his name was Mahmoud. And it is also said that the Quraysh left the city after making lots of dua. Abdul Muttalib is pleading in front of the Kaaba. Oh Allah, we cannot fight this army. They're too strong for us. They have these elephants. They have these thousand men, whatever. You take care of it. And they then left to the mountains. And this is when they faced Mahmoud to the, the Kaaba and they are telling him to go and go and go. And he would not go. Even if they whipped him, they beat him, they bled him. Elephant would not move. But whenever they turned him in any other direction, he would move in that direction. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. اشهد ان لا اله الا الله اشهد ان لا أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح حي على
الصلاة خير من النوم الصلاة خير من النوم الله أكبر الله أكبر اللهم رب هذه الدعوة التامة والصلاة القائمة آت محمدا الوسيلة والفضيلة وابعثه مقاما محمودا إنك لا تخلف الميعاد. That is when large birds came, أرسلنا عليهم طيرا أبابيل ترميهم بحجارة من سجيل. So stones from Jahannam. Imagine stones from Jahannam in this world. They're coming. And in front of their eyes, every stone hits an animal and a person, and he literally dissolves. His skin dissolves, and he becomes a pile of broken and molten flesh in front of the eyes of the people of uh, Quraysh. And it is said that Abraha himself suffered the worst fate, and they carried him back, and his skin is dissolving the entire way, and he dies right before reaching his home in Yemen, uh, so that he suffers the worst punishment, that he's just about there, and then he dies and he is buried over there. There's also some hidden wisdom here, some semi-mystical wisdom here, that we have a Christian attacking a pagan, Abraha attacking Abdul Muttalib, and the Kaaba is the subject of attack. And neither of them is able to defend. In fact, the one is de attacking and the other cannot defend. And Allah defends the Haram. And who was living in the Haram at the time? Amina, and she must have been pregnant with our Prophet So quite literally, because he's born in the same year, a few months later. So this means Amina, when the incident of Feel takes place, our Prophet is literally in the womb of Amina. So there's a huge symbolism here that Allah Himself protects not just the Kaaba, but what else? Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is, it is as if to indicate that the Mushrikun could not protect the Kaaba. They're not worthy of the Kaaba. So Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala destroyed those who attempted to harm it because there will come now somebody who will be worthy of the Kaaba. The Quraysh have not been worthy to the level they deserve. So somebody will now come and that is our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who purified it of its idols, who made it the Qibla and who returned it to the glory that it was and that is the uh, initial house that Ibrahim Alayhi Salam built. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala ali Muhammad. Today we're going to learn the master way, the master formula for asking Allah for forgiveness. And this is taught by the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to one of his dear Sahaba, Shaddad ibn Awsin Radiallahu Anhu Arta. This hadith is collected by Imam al-Bukhari and it's a wonderful, wonderful hadith. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, whoever says in his day with conviction, man qala fi yawmi fi naharihi, in the one who says in the daytime, in his morning, in his um, uh, busy lifestyle, the one who remembers to say in his day, and he says it with conviction, with Iman, who says these words and dies before the evening, they will enter paradise. Dakhal al Jannah. And the one who says this in his evening and then goes to sleep or retires, and he says it in the nighttime, and he dies before the next morning, and he has said these words with conviction, with Iman in their heart, فهو فلاه الجنة. they will have an entrance in Jannah. 
These are the words that the Prophet Sallallahu teaches are the greatest way of asking Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala for forgiveness. Now notice each and every one of these words links us back to Allah, makes us remember our standing before Allah. And the concept of dhikr, the concept of a prophetic protection is that it's something that makes you think of the consequences of our life so that we are able to change it and make it for the better. We ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to give us insight into the inner workings of our hearts so that we can become better human beings and better on the day of judgment as we stand before Allah in the ranks and in the nation of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has inspired in the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to teach us these words Allahumma anta rabbi la ilaha illa ant Look at how we begin look at the words of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam Allahumma O oh Allah, to me you are, Rabbi, my Lord. Notice, it's not Rabbana. Although you will say this in public, you say Rabbi because in your heart you want it to be as if I am alone with you, O oh Allah. I confess my sins with you, O oh Allah, that I want nobody else to know. Rabbi, you're my Lord. O oh Allah, give me all of your attention, Ya Rabb. I'm in need of you, Ya Rabb. Allahumma anta Rabbi, to me you are the only Rabbi that I have. And this is the completion of Tawheed al rububiyyah that Allah is the center of all of your care. He is your creator, your maker, your sustainer. You put your hope and trust in Allah. Allahumma anta rabbi la ilaha illa ant. Because I've taken you as my Rabb, as the only one who I acknowledge is my creator and maker, la ilaha illa ant. I will make you the only deity, the only one I worship. Because I know who you are, and therefore I recognize you're the only one worthy of that. Anta Rabbi. Allahumma anta Rabbi. La ilaha illa ant. Except you. This acknowledgement is not something that you just make on your behalf. You then say, Khalaqtani. You're my creator. La ilaha illa anta khalaqtani. Wa ana abduk. And I acknowledge that as you are my creator, I am your slave and servant. وَأَنَا وَابْنُ عَبْدِكَ Not just I am your servant, but whether my parents know it or not, whether they worshipped you as you deserve or not, whether people recognize you or not, my father is your slave. My mother is your slave. خَلَقْتَنِي وَأَنَا عَبْدُكَ وَأَنَا عَلَىٰ عَهْدِكَ وَوَعَدِكَ مَا اسْتَطَعْتَ Oh Allah, I make this covenant and promise, and I make this a devotional promise to you. Ahdika wa wa'dik. I have made a covenant and I make a promise to you, O oh Allah. Mastata'at, as long as I'm able in life. O oh Allah, forgive me what I forgot. Forgive me the mistakes I make. Forgive me the lapses in my judgment. Mastata'at. A'udhu bika min sharri ma sanat. O oh Allah, I seek protection with you from the sins that I have made. Subhanallah. This is such a, an amazing admission of our guilt before Allah. We are not of those who have al aqid al iblisiya the shaitanic understanding of what it means to make mistakes. Iblis, he blames Allah. He says, Qala fabima Oh Allah, you're the one who allowed me to make mistakes. It's your fault, not my fault. No, we have the i'tiqad of Ahl Sunnah, the Aqeedah of the people of faith, that ظلمنا أنفسنا, we wronged ourselves. وَإِن لَمْ تَغْفِرْ لَنَا If you don't forgive me, who will forgive me, O oh Allah? مَا استطعت أعوذ بك I ask you for protection. At-ta'awud means that you know that you are weak and Allah is the mighty. You know that only Allah can save you from the inequity of your own sins. A'udhu bika min sharri ma sanat. From sharra ma sanat. From the mistakes that I have made, O oh Allah. Abu'u laka bi ni'matika alay. I put forward the blessings that you have given me. I acknowledge what you have favored me with. The day that I'm living, the air that I'm breathing, the water that I drink, the life that I have, the family that I... Everything that I have, even the things that I thought I disliked, I am thankful to you, O oh Allah. بِنِعْمَتِكَ عَلَيْ وَأَبُوءُ لَكَ بِذَنْبِ And I put forward, I know in acknowledgement, the mistakes that I have made. فَاغْفِرْ لِي O oh Allah, forgive me. فَإِنَّهُ لَا يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ إِلَّا أَنْتِ Because ultimately I know that none can forgive me except you, O Allah. Now what's so important about Sayyid al-Istighfar is that it is an acknowledgement between you and Allah that will help you in whatever disturbances you have with others. So just say, my dear brother, my dear sister, you've had a fight with your spouse. 
and you've had contention and hardship and you come back to your senses, but instead of talking about your problem with them first, you first acknowledge your mistake between you and Allah that I was unjust, that I went out of line, that I spoke words that are not right. I am nothing more than a slave in front of God. I know that I'm accountable to him even before her or him. I'm accountable to my mistakes before you, O oh Allah, I ask you to forgive me first because without the forgiveness of Allah, who will turn the heart of my spouse back towards me if I have been wayward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And therefore the Prophet ﷺ tells us that Allah is the one who turns the hearts and Allah turns hearts from us and to us. And if we are good with Allah, we can be assuming that we can gain the help of Allah to turn a heart that is turned away from us back towards us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to benefit us with this prophetic protection of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sayyid al-Istighfar is an important weapon and tool of the believers to adjust and to bring back balance in their life. Allahumma anta rabbi la ilaha illa anta khalaqtani wa ana abduka wa ana ala ahadika wa wa'adika ma stata'at. أبوء أعوذ بك من شر ما صنعت وأبوء لك بنعمتك علي وأبوء لك بذنبي فاغفر لي فإنه لا يغفر الذنوب إلا أنت اللهم اغفر لنا زلاتنا وأخطائنا يا أرحم الراحمين Oh Allah forgive us the slips and the mistakes that we make the sinful deeds that we have performed and allow us to come back to you using this prophetic protection of our Nabi Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم وصلي اللهم وسلم وزد وبارك على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to amazing episode of Ramadan TV and inshallah this series is just for you we've put together a program called design your ramadan that allows you to really maximize and plan and get the most out of ramadan this particular ramadan obviously it's a lot different than the ramadans in the past everyone's going to be at home and that's why this series is called the stay home edition so you can maximize and get the most out of your ramadan while you're at home this particular workshop, alhamdulillah, was designed about two years ago and alhamdulillah has been since delivered in South Australia and in Victoria and it basically allows you to design and plan the Ramadan in every aspect of your life in a holistic aspect in order for us to plan and then in order to achieve and inshallah be from the successful in Ramadan. I hope we find this beneficial inshallah. So we'll get started. First of all, design. A definition of design, as we can see here, a plan or drawing produced to show the look and function or workings of a building garment or other object before it is made. So the concept of designing or planning is basically we lay out what we want to do, what we want to achieve, all the things that we want to do in Ramadan. And therefore it puts a structure for us in order for us to achieve every one of them. So inshallah, we do it to the best of our capabilities and to the best of our abilities and that Allah would accept it and it would be more successful than we've ever had before. First things first is I want us to ask some questions and there might be simple questions. How do I want to start or end my Ramadan? Some of these I want us to reflect on these questions. So how do I want to start and end my Ramadan? And again, this is for you to contemplate and think and actually ask yourself, how do I want to do this? What do I want to achieve in Ramadan? Or what, what are the things that I want to achieve in Ramadan? And finally, who is actually craving an amazing Ramadan? Put your hands up if you actually crave an amazing Ramadan. And although I can't see you, I'm assuming you're putting your hands up. And I've got my hand up, inshallah, so all of us can have an amazing Ramadan. The plan of attack when we do anything is number one, we have our intention. Number two, we set the goals. Number three, based on the goals, we create the plan to take us to the goals. And number four is to execute. And this is the most simplest and basic way in order for us to achieve anything that we want by the will of Allah. And this concept is the same concept, whether it's in your spirituality, whether it's in business, whether it's in your career, whether it's in your family, anything you want to do in life. So again, intention, set goals, plan and execute. We've all heard the saying that if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. So by default, we need to plan in order for us to be successful. And this is actually from the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. However, 
our plan must be clear and at the same time specifically revolving around Ramadan it shouldn't be over ambitious one common thing we find year after year is that people put these over ambitious goals in Ramadan and what ends up happening is that they're unable to achieve them because of the emotion attributed to the beginning of Ramadan everyone gets excited and puts all these big um, uh, plans and you know uh, they want to recite the Quran 10 times 20 times they want to do this they want to stay up all night and so on and rea the reality is is that a lot of people given their lifestyle and given their circumstances it's a struggle for them and what happens is if the plan that they put in at the beginning is over ambitious then by the end of Ramadan they feel that they've failed and they attribute Ramadan to not being able to be successful in what they uh, planned out to achieve so the plan is, is that it must be clear but at the same time not over ambitious first things first you are responsible you are responsible for whatever happens to you the Prophet ﷺ, he said in Hadith when Ramadan comes the gates of paradise are opened and the gates of hellfire are closed and the devils are chained up. So this is, we can't blame shaitan for anything that takes place and these are opportunities where the gates of Jannah are open, the gates of Jahannam are closed. So let us be mature, let us be responsible and take full responsibility for ourselves, for our plans, for our goals and for our actions. Insha'Allah. Now, this is something that uh, is very profound if we understand it the right way. Plan like you have 20 Ramadans, but worship like it's your last. What does this mean? So is it only one Ramadan that you have in your life? And the answer is no. We have many Ramadans in life. Obviously we don't know when our life will end and again this is in the hands of Allah. But at least on the basis that Allah will give us a long life in order for us to worship Him and do lots of good deeds, we plan like we have 20, but we worship like it's our last one. And how does this, how do we understand this? If I think that this Ramadan is my last one, I'm going to exert myself and put all these over ambitious goals because I think it's my last one and this is where the ambitious goals comes into play as well. And we want to do so much and all of this. And what happens is that we struggle to do all of that thinking that this Ramadan we should worship like it's our last Ramadan. And the point here is that if we have a strategy to say that in 10 years time or 10 Ramadans time, I want to be able to be achieving this and this and this in my life, in my ibadah, in my work, in my family and so on. How do I get to that? And we know this from the Sunnah of the way that Allah revealed the Quran. He revealed it in stages. In many aspects, he did it in stages, as an example, like uh, interest and like uh, alcohol. So we do the same thing, saying that if I want to achieve this level in 20 Ramadans, what does it mean I have to achieve in this Ramadan, and then the second Ramadan, and then the third Ramadan, and then the fourth Ramadan, and so on. So it grows up gradually and is more sustainable as opposed to spiking and then going down. So we plan like we have 20 Ramadans and I'll tell you the virtues of planning this, this long as well. But the quality of our worship in this one is like it's our last. So as an example, if I want to say in 20 years time I want to be able to pray 12 rakat of tahajjud every single night. Then step number one, this Ramadan, I'm only going to start with two rakat once a week. Although I can do more. I don't want to because I'm, I'm building this gradually and every Ramadan I'm using it as an opportunity to grow and grow. However, the quality of those first two rak'at in this year, I worship them like it's my last year. Understand this point? So we plan like we have 20, but the quality of our worship is like it's our last. This is an example of the Tabi'een, which is a generation that came after the Sahaba. May Allah be pleased with them. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, The lifespan of my Ummah is from 60 to 70 years. This is the average age of the Ummah or the nation of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Now, during the Sahaba, they sacrificed their lives, uh, they sacrificed Allah in order to establish Islam. So by the time the second generation came about, Islam and all the hard work was already done, it was already established. So the Tabi'een, they had a golden opportunity to now further develop 
the nation and to further develop uh, the deen and the knowledge and to seek more. And it's interesting to find that a lot of the great scholars of hadith and the books of hadith like Imam Bukhari, Imam Muslim and also the uh, scholars of fiqh like Imam Malik, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi'i, Imam Ahmad all of that great knowledge came about in that generation. So you can see the virtues of that generation but at the same time once the foundations were laid it was a lot easier to develop and go further. So how did they used to plan their life? And this is an example that one of the scholars he gave. If they used to think that as an example, based on the hadith, that I'm going to live 60 years. They used to spend the first 30 years seeking knowledge and learning. So from when they're born until they're 30 years old, they would seek knowledge and learn. Then from the age of 30 to 40, they would teach. And what teaching does, it gives you a deeper understanding of the knowledge that you gain. And then from 40 to 50, obviously at that time you're at the maturest level intellectually. That's when they write books. And writing of the books uh, uh, concretes the knowledge that they had and also allows them uh, to keep it behind after they pass away. So this is like a sadaqa jariya for them. And then from 50 to 60 or until they pass away, uh, they focus their time in ibadah, worshipping Allah, getting ready to meet Him. Now, where's the beauty in this? Is that if they were to plan all of this and then live to apply all of this, then this is excellent. But if Allah was to take their life at the age of 30, they will come on the day of judgment with all of that seeking knowledge, in addition to 10 years of teaching, in addition to 10 years of writing books, in addition to 10 years focusing only on worshipping Allah. Why? Because that was their intention and that was their plan and they were working on that plan as they went. So these are golden uh, principles that our predecessors used to have and really this is a golden opportunity for us to also do the same so we can benefit like they did and benefit others as well like they did. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, indeed the reward of deeds performed depend on the last actions. So this, we know that the, the rewards of the deeds depend on the last actions. So we want to use Ramadan to build this momentum that continues after the month finishes and this is also a sign of acceptance. That uh, a sign of acceptance before and after is that your life is different and changed obviously for the better um, after Ramadan as it was before Ramadan. And the same thing goes with Hajj. That if your life after Hajj is different to your life before Hajj, this is also a sign of acceptance. So keep this in mind, obviously, when we're performing our deeds. And again, keep this in mind when we go through the graphs now as well. All right. So as you can see, currently, this is how our Ramadans most likely look. So you can see here that at the beginning of Ramadan, there's a big spike. And you can even apply this to the number of people you see at Tarawih. So at the beginning, it goes up. And then it goes down over the days. And then this little kink over here is what day? Day number 20. So this one goes, has a little kink and then it continues to go down. And then this one here is a particular night that everyone knows about, which is Layat al-Qadr. This spikes up a lot. And then what happens the three nights after that, it goes back down until Eid. So if you look here, the beginning of Ramadan and the end of Ramadan, nothing changed. In the middle, it was very... Uh, turbulent. Whereas if we have a plan, look at this, we begin in this way and then the second set of 10 days we step it up a notch and then the last 10 days we step it up a notch in order so the top bit, the, the end of Ramadan is higher than the beginning of Ramadan and clearly over here you can see the difference between the two. So we want to go for the blue line not for the pink line. And this is a little uh, image or illustration that can show you the difference between sprinting and the marathon and obviously at the end the marathon is the one that wins. There is a principle, this is obviously in business, that you cannot do the same thing every year and expect better results. If you want things to change, things need to change. These five words changed my life and the life of many as well. One of the scholars he said, if nothing changes, Nothing changes. So if you want to change things this Ramadan, 
you need to change things. So you need to change things in your routine, you need to change things in your outlook, you need to change things in your lifestyle, you need to change the way you do things, when you do things, the discipline and so on. So if we really want to have an amazing Ramadan, we've got to put in all the things required in order to have this amazing Ramadan. What's the importance of having goals? And I use this particular image uh, specifically, um, and that is to show that there is a current point and a destination point. If our goals are clear, then our path is clear. There's a, there's a scene in uh, one of the uh, cartoons, Alice in Wonderland, where Alice actually comes to an intersection and she sees a cat and she says to the cat, which way should I go? So the cat replies and says, it depends on where you want to get to. So Alice says, it really doesn't matter. So then the cat says, then it really doesn't matter which way you go. And this is a lot of people's lives and a lot of our Ramadans, this is what it's like. If I was to say, for example, get in the car and drive, where are you going? If I was to say, get in the car and take me to this particular destination, you know exactly what road to take, exactly what roads not to take, and what's the shortest and quickest way to get there. And if you look at our deen, our entire deen is based on goals. If you were to ask every single Muslim, what's your ultimate goal? Everyone would say, what? Well, Jannah. So if my ultimate goal is Jannah, then the path of Jannah now becomes clear because I know what path to take and what path not to take, or what path to take me away from Jannah. So it makes it a lot easier to take decisions, to say yes, to do this, to do that, and so on. So at the beginning, as we mentioned the hadith about the intentions, uh, it's important to know, to understand our intention behind Ramadan and why we're doing what we do in Ramadan. So from the beginning, our intention, we have two. So the Prophet ﷺ, he says, whoever fasts Ramadan uh, with uh, hope of getting reward and uh, being accounted for, then Allah will forgive what he brings forth from sins or what he's brought forth from sins. So all of his sins will be forgiven. And in another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ, he said, indeed actions are by intentions and everyone will be rewarded for what they intended. So our intention is very important and our Sharia and Islam, our deen teaches us this. The second thing is why? What's the purpose of all of this? And we have two points here. One of them is Ramadan, the other one is fasting. Understanding why you are doing everything you do this month, if understood, then you can identify everything that would lead you to your goals and ultimately our goal of Jannah. Number one, Ramadan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, the month of Ramadan is that in which was revealed the Qur'an, a guidance for the people and clear proofs of guidance and criterion. And if you look here, going from left to right, so Ramadan is the month which the Qur'an was revealed for what? Guidance. And if we seek guidance, we seek it through the Qur'an and especially during the month of Ramadan. So like the ayah goes this way, we can take the ayah back in order to find our plan. This is regarding Ramadan. Now regarding fasting, the Prophet Allah SWT says, O you who believe, fasting is decreed upon you as it was decreed upon those before you that you may become God conscious. So you may have taqwa. And the concept of taqwa is that you are aware of Allah in all things that you do, in all matters. And one of the amazing things behind this is that for one month, Allah has made what's normally halal for us, haram. In order so that our discipline of knowing that although I can eat this and no one's watching me except Allah and it's halal, in this time I'm still holding myself. I'm disciplining myself. 30 days of training with no waswasa from shaitan. I can do this for 30 days. So then after the 30 days, staying away from the haram becomes even easier. If I'm able to stay away from halal for 30 days, after that staying away from haram is even easier. That's it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you got something out of it. Stay tuned because next episode we're going to begin talking about all the aspects of our lives to do with Ramadan and designing our most amazing Ramadan that we've ever had. So stay tuned, clear your intentions, reflect on why we're doing all of this as well. 
and I hope and I ask Allah that He allows us to get the most out of this Ramadan with or without the Masjid so we can get closer to Him and be successful in dunya and in the Akhirah. Jazakumullah khair. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.